<laughs> so I wanted Hello. to start by asking you, Mark, about the genesis of the film, because I read that it, the initial idea came from the fact that you were accused of gay napping a couple of young children in Chicago. Yes. Oh, my gosh, you did your homework. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. OK, so I mean, I started writing the movie because I was a babysitter in Chicago, and I was taking care of two kids who were half Laotian, half Puerto Rican. And people always looked at me like I was a weirdo when I was with them, because they were like, clearly, you're not the dad. I also was maybe more queer presenting. Like, I painted my nails. I was kind of grungy. Um, but the kids loved me. And I would be like, let's wear our Halloween costumes today all year round. <laughs> so we like made a ruckus wherever we went. And at the grocery store, some old wom woman was really upset because one of them was crying about candy. And I took his hand, and I was like, we can't get candy. And she thought that I was like kidnapping this kid and was like trying to call like for help from the grocery store workers. Anyways, I was like, I'm like, I'm his babysitter. And then like both kids were just like, they were scared of her. And like I picked them up and like got out. <laughs> and then in general, with the film being kind of based on your own experiences in life and living in New York, what were some of the other trajectories that you wanted to pull in from your own experience into the film? I mean, I'm not a visual artist, except a filmmaker, but I don't draw, and I don't draw dicks. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I pretend like I am in the movie. And uh, no, I was a babysitter in Park Slope, and it was a wild ride, and I wanted to write about what it's like to be a, a, a man taking care of kids and being um, a young artist in New York, not knowing what to do and not knowing how to take care of yourself. And I just wanted to amplify it, um, turn it into a... Uh, a heartfelt story, but also turned into something that was w really bizarre. Um, I met uh, a real leather daddy in li real life, the actor who plays um, Leather Man, named Christian Patrick, and he was in a James Franco movie called Interior Leather Bar, and uh, he was like the missing piece to my script. I'd written just a story about Milo and Mark, and when I met him, I was like, he's like gonna be my spirit guide. And uh, and mostly, I just learned from him about the community, but I didn't want to like fully try to represent that community. It's more of an um, you know we're we're looking at how people communicate, and Leatherman is the like he's all about self care and communication, and um, and just speaking about how you feel. And Mark doesn't know how to do that. He's very stunted. And then for you and Ben, how did that relationship as co-directors come about and the decision that you both wanted to be involved in the creative process from that respect? Yeah, well, uh, we didn't know each other before um, I got the script through a friend of a friend of a friend, I think. And, um, and then we finally got to meet each other after I'd read it and fallen in love with it. And um, we, I don't know, we vibed on a lot of levels. The same, we liked the same kind of movies. Um, we both were struggling to live in New York City, even at the time. Um, and I really, I wanted to explore, and I think this is one of the things that Mark wanted to explore, was different visions of masculinity and uh, the kind of myriad uh, masculinities that are presented in the film were um, a big part of the journey for me. Yeah. There's also, you know, I think there's a, a lot of privilege in directing duos. Usually you hear about people who met at college or uh, it's a friend of a friend or it's just like famous people um, who are directing together. And Ben and I, you know, we didn't, we didn't have the resources. Like we're, we're educated, but like we didn't have a short film under our belt. Like we didn't, we, we gave ourselves permission to make it. And I had to search for someone who believed in the story. And that was really hard. And when I found Ben and he believed in the, the character and believed in the heart, that was what I knew. Because there was a lot of people who looked at the script and thought, I want to make this more sexual. I want to, I mean, do things that I was like, no way. Like, why do you want to do that? Because they wanted to turn it into something that it just wasn't. And Ben believed in my script. And, you know, I we shot on 16 millimeter. I never watched myself act throughout the whole thing. We didn't see our film until a month later. And it was silent. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but Ben was there to like direct me, and I think it's a miracle that you could you can actually meet someone in New York and and become creative partners. Yeah. And because you mentioned shooting on sixteen millimeters, why was it so important for you to do that? Because obviously that creates a lot more challenges financially and logistically. When you're really 
dumb and young and ambitious. Naive is the word, I think. And naive, but dumb. Um, <laughs> you think, whatever, we can do it. And we, we hypothesized that it would be the same within a budget when we pretended like, you know, we'll cut this out and then the film will, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. I mean, in a way, like, we only did a couple takes for a lot of, a lot of things. Like, we didn't waste film and we didn't overbuy. We were, we were fine. I mean, like, because we shot in such a small amount of time, film might have been perfect because people were so scared. They were petrified that what we were doing. And so it was super serious, and we, we got it, and we moved on. And in terms of the um, the reason why we were so inspired to do it. Jeff Anger's um, films um, that it, he created in a lot of ways or captured a community that was um, dressing that way and bringing this leather culture to life. And he shot on 16 millimeter, and in some ways it was an homage to that, but it also, I think immediately you're, you know you're in a different world when the first frame is in 16 millimeter. And that gave us room for Mark's fantasy to live without trying, without being too hyper realistic, um, too, um, I don't know, natural, naturalistic. We could just play and have fantasy and animation. And yeah, we that. felt good about it because it's a fairy tale. It's yeah. a New York fairy tale. And if we shot on digital, it would be weird. I mean, it just wouldn't have worked. And uh, I was very inspired by. Uh, certain films, one being Sheila Levine is Dead and Living in New York City with uh, Jeannie Berlin. And I had watched that movie. She moves to New York from Ohio. Her parents drive her at the beginning. Um, and I just, I loved the vibe of the film. It almost could take place today. There's not a lot of timely things except like cars and, you know, the 1970s New York. But I wanted to make like a timeless feeling story about a, a young person in New York. And that's why there's no talk of like politics and very little cell phone usage and yeah. Right. And Patricia, your involvement in the film actually came a year after the initial piece was shot as some additional footage and kind of like adding in your character as an on-screen presence. What were the aspects that you felt were really rich and nuanced? Because she comes across incredibly three-dimensional from the moment she walks onto the screen and berates her son and tells him that he's somewhat unbearable. I thought I was being supportive. <laughs> I don't know about berating him. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, no, I, um, w when I came in, it was, it was Henry, um, who was the casting director, who had cast me in a play just right before that. And I'd come back to New York. He's getting ready to go back to LA. And he said, do you want to do this film? And they're just going to add this character and come in, shoot for a week, and do it. And I trust Henry and love him. And he was very complimentary about our genius here, our little genius. Um, uh, <laughs> I was very fortunate in that when we started to work before we even shot, I met with David France, and uh, who is our executive producer. And this is definitely, you know, a little bit different because he's known for How to Survive a Plague, um, but he was a mentor, and Patricia was excited. And, and the with three of us just met, and we spent like a whole day just sort of talking about this relationship and why is she, she, who she is and why she's getting him out of Indiana and does she really know that, I mean, my thought was that she kind of knows that this is, that this is not really a job, but I got to get him out of Indiana because I know he doesn't belong there. And, and, and so, uh, you know, I just, as soon as he says this, I just, we throw all of his stuff in the car, there's not even a suitcase, <laughs> you know, it's a box. So I just, throw it all in the car and get him to New York because I know all the odd people go to New York. So, you know, I'm like, get him to New York. So, but I, I think that all parents, that, that scary thing of when you have an unusual child and you, you gotta push them out of the nest and you don't know if they're gonna fly or just <laughs> goes flat. So she doesn't know in the whole movie she's frantic because he once he gets there, he never calls her or, or lets her know what's going on. For all she knows, he could be dead. So um, the rest of the movie, I'm calling, I'm trying to, and I'm sending him Klonopin. <laughs> so I'm also his drug enabler. <laughs> and, um, um, but I, I loved this, this character because there was, I don't even remember if it's still in, we had this whole part where I'm saying to you, this, you're kind of who I was and oh, yeah. I totally get this because well, I really never fit into Indiana e either, but I never got out and so, you know, so uh, I just love that we were able to just create this character together and then go do it. You know, that is wonderful for yeah, me. I mean, I, we wrote and filmed the movie and there was a lot of things missing that we didn't know were missing. And I went back at it and it's like I kind of surgically like rearranged the script and added new characters. 
even Zachary's character like wasn't in the original. Zachary's at the end. He played S, the art gallery receptionist. So yeah, his name is wonderfully. S. Um, but I added these characters in, and I, it was to bring Mark's life t to another level in this this wacky, bizarre ensemble. Uh, the movie also we shot in 16 days, 16 originally, and that's really hard. So I had to go back and do we had to go back and do six or seven. Um, and because you were talking about Zachary's role, I was curious for you. You bring such humor into that scene, and and how you kind of navigated the way that you wanted to kind of poke fun at the stereotypes of working in an art gallery, but also kind of giving it a three-dimensional feel on screen. I was listening, but I don't know that I heard the question. <laughs> Did, is that just me? So it's really about like <laughs> navigating the humor of the scene coming oh, sure. in for just like a, a well, brief I'm moment. Well, I'm not. Uh, I'm not funny. And um, he so did that's not want to take the part. I was that's like, tricky. Take, it. take the you part, know? Zachary. Um, but I, I, I didn't. You know, I just sort of trusted Mark and was like, "Oh, let's go on a ride." It was one day, you know, and I was like, "Well, let me go see what what this guy wants me to do." And and <laughs> and you know, he was just very supportive. It was like a lovely group of people, and you know, we were in this like basement. You know, it was like a very like renegade filmmaking. You know, I loved it. I mean, that's that's what I like to do. So I don't know. I don't feel like I really navigated much of anything. Also, to be honest, I haven't seen it yet. So I'll take your word for it <laughs> that uh, it's so funny. I get to see it tonight for the first time. Um, but I just, I don't know. I just, like, trusted the writing. It's all about writing and, like, playing opposite Mark, you know. Like, he's funny, you know. I just sort of showed up. I'm so and serious, then, like, whatever person. came out, if it made me look good, that's just great editing. So <laughs> kudos to them. And then, Peter, I wanted to ask you about your character's on-screen relationship with his wife and with his child, because you give such a strong sense of who he is as a husband and a father, and what were some of the conversations you had with the actors you were playing against in your family on how you were going to bring that to life for us? Um, well, uh, Janine Sorales, who plays my wife in the movie, we actually went to school together, so we and we did a play together before shooting the movie, and uh, I don't think you even knew that. Um, that was not on purpose. No. Yeah, no, no, no. So when I found out it was Janine, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. I've always wanted to be, be her husband. So, um, <laughs> so we just had instantaneous um, rapport, which was really convenient, um, and uh, in terms of Joseph, who plays Milo, um, I mean, the kid is, like, adorable, right? So how can you not just want to, like, hold him and, like, squeeze him? <laughs> and uh, so we didn't have that much prep time, actually, with Milo, uh, with uh, jo Joseph, the actor. But um, he he was, like, a pro, and, you know, um, I don't like kids. Uh, <laughs> I really, I mean, I, I'm a child. I'm like the the fourth of uh, I have three older siblings, and uh, I have no desire to have children, and um, so I always treat kids like little adults, and I think sometimes that um, that's useful. Um, I just treated him with like, like you're you and I'm me, and let's try to figure this out together. So what's nice is that Peter is like the submissive parent, like like Annie's the dom and he's the totally. sub. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and it's so lovely because I think he's trying to really understand Mark, and so does Annie. I mean, they're they are good. I think the characters are good parents, and what happens to Mark, it, it, it was okay. That was supposed to happen, uh, but it, it is co sort of real in Park Slope how a lot of parents they have kids and they don't spend time with them because they're working all day. And a lot of the families that I babysat for in Park Slope. Uh, they've all moved, all the four-year-olds. I was like, four-year-old is like my my niche, I guess. I don't know. Four-year-olds love me, and their imaginations are awesome. But a lot of those kids, they moved out of the city because the parents, like, you don't know, how, you don't have time to spend with your kids. And I think that was very nice to see the love that Annie and Charles had for for Milo, but also feel like really that Milo and Mark are more of a, they're more together. They're they're more in sync and understand each other. And for you and Ben, kind of, I'd love if you could talk a little bit about how you worked with Joseph and how you wanted to direct him as a child actor and how you really brought that out. And, and I think especially having you acting against him in scenes must have helped with the relationship and the rapport on camera. Yeah, well, we, we cast him because he was maybe the least trained person that, that we saw. And he was, I mean, instantly in the room together reading 
before we cast him, they had there was a little bit of a, a spark between the two of you. And then, yeah, there wasn't much prep time for, for most of the cast, but the, we that's what we him. did was with Mark and Milo. And it was focused mostly on forming just a bond between the two of you so that in the scenes you had together, you were really guiding the scene um, and guiding Milo and being there as it has, I mean, his mom was there to take care of him, but you were there as his safety net because it can get scary, I think, for kids and get overwhelming. He was the only kid in the audition room that would improvise when I went off script. Right. Every other kid was like, I know exactly what this script is and I'm gonna, and with him, he just kind of like giggled when I did a weird, you know, ridiculous thing. Like, and that was really special. And, and uh, Henry Russell Bergstein, who was our casting director, who did Succession, um, he created this beautiful ensemble that, you know, supported me and made me look good because they've all done so many movies and TV. Um, but he cast the kids in Moonrise Kingdom. So he brought in a lot of good kids, but we were like, we want Joseph because he's so fresh, he's brand new, he hasn't done anything except print. And um, yeah, I don't know, I really, we've been traveling around the world with the film, like we've been to many countries and everyone is enamored by him because it's so natural and loving. And th it's funny, yesterday the Gotham Award nominations came out and I see this breakthrough actor thing and you know, there's that kid Noah Jupe from Honey Boy, and they're like breakthrough actor, and it's like he was in the the Quiet Place. He's been in so many movies. Like, what does breakthrough mean anymore? You know, like <laughs> not that you know, but it's just interesting in terms of the indie film. Like, we really, I mean, it's it's an anomaly that this movie exists with me, who's never done anything, and with Milo and with the Leatherman, and. Um, but then we have all these people supporting us that are pros, and I'm so lucky that Patricia, Peter, and Zachary would come on board and believe in Ben and I. And I wanted to ask um, Patricia, Peter, and Zachary a quick question about your acting process and, and the way that you prep for roles, because as Mark was mentioning, you've all done so many different things, whether it's leading roles, supporting roles, television and film, and, and kind of if when you're taking a leading role on something, if your prep is massively different to when you're coming in to just kind of like fill a few scenes, but again, give that really three-dimensional feel on camera. I don't know if I would say that I always have the same prep. It's not, in this case, it was great because we were able to get together and talk it out and kind of figure it out and I'm just sort of improving. We did a lot of improv in the car uh, and in all those scenes in that first, we kind of developed it and, and sort of wrote it as we went along. And I mean, Patricia is a writer and, and a lot of the moments, I mean, those are her words. Like mm, so she is a mother and, and you have a gay son and we connected immediately on that. You know, And, and actually we're, we're driving my gay son's bumper car from Brooklyn. In that it's scene, her, it's in that her scene, son's car. that's my that's my son's beat up Honda. Uh, no, a Prius. And and we hung the camera on w in on one window, and then and we're just driving back and forth on this road, and then we hang the camera on the other window and drive back it and forth on the road. It was scary. And, and so yeah, she's and really driving. Everybody, I, I'm actually, she's <laughs> really I'm just driving. Trying to drive, and they're they're going slower. And, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, and I kept on thinking a, like a tractor was going to go by and just smack the camera <laughs> off. But it was, it you know, happen. it was really beautiful out there. It's why I l added that line because it was so pretty. Yeah. You know, I was like, oh, it's really pretty out here. And yeah. so they put it in. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but no, that so that's that process. But and then you know when you're doing a sitcom, in that case it was also very much. Um, us kind of writing it as we went along because you know we're just like on the stage and it, it, the script is changing every single day and it's really our lives and the, the cancer episode came about because my son had a thyroid cancer scare and the hysterectomy was I don't know I had one and I have three sisters so she had four sisters and my parents, my whole family's military so her family's military and so you know everything just kind of comes that again is also something a lot of it is coming out of what you're just saying and it's you don't ever ever have to sit down and memorize lines because you're just writing them on the spot and doing it. And, and, and they, no, they're, they're writing it, but everything is just sort of changing. And because you're on your feet rehearsing during the day, you just kind of learn it. But uh, so every process is different. I mean, it just depends. When I'm doing a play, that's a whole different thing because you have such a long rehearsal period. So that's a different process. So, I, you know, I can't really say, um, oh, I do Stanislavski. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, uh, for me, um, the thing that was unique about this experience was that, you know, the, the, I call it, like, the breakup scene where um, Charles and Annie have to 
fire uh, mark. Um, and I feel like when we were shooting it, we had to rewrite it on the fly, like on set. We were like, oh shoot, okay, we have to, we actually have to like re kind of rewrite this thing. And then we improved it, and then I think it kind of was a, a Frankenstein mix of all of that. And that's not typically the experiences that I get. Like usually it's very like scripted, so you just have to do what you're kind of given. Um, so this was that was a really fun uh, new way of working for me. Yeah. I mean, this was terrifying. I think coming in and doing uh, like a, d a day, a half a day on of work on somebody's baby, right? Like that you know, like if having done a f films, you understand how hard it is to get a film made. It's nearly impossible. And I'm, you know, I meet this person, I read this script, it's so wonderful and charming and moving, and I'm like, oh God, you know, so now like we've got this half a day to go in and try to figure out the dynamic, how this person works, what they're looking for, what the vibe is gonna be. And also, like I said, I'm not funny and I could tell it was supposed to be funny. Don't give it away. <laughs> and, and so there's like, there was, there's, for me, it's, there's a lot of pressure. So I think the preparation for me is, a, it's a lot different. Like when you go in and you're carrying a film, you sort of, even if it is only 18 days, that's, Almost three weeks, that feels like a luxurious amount of time to sort of interact with the people and get the vibe on the set and then you start to play off of each other and, and you can have that freedom. And for me, this was a very different experience. So my preparation really was just to be as exact and perfect as I could be on what I could tell they wanted from me, which was just the script that they'd given me and this idea of what I was supposed to look like and try to, and then sort of like get there and be as ready as I could in that moment to then throw it all away if it turned out that Mark was a little nuts which, you know, he is which in the best possible way. So, like, who the are we talking about? My character or me? Huh? Who are we talking about? My character or me? You don't get uh, to both. ask that question since you named the character your name. <laughs> How dare you? Um, but so yeah, it was a very it's it's very different and terrifying. But then it becomes very freeing, you know. With all of them, I mean, Ben and I both went to school for acting. Um, that's where that's our, where we came from, um, and. I felt so taken care of by Patricia and Peter and Zachary. Uh, for example, the firing scene with Peter and Janine, Ben was talking with them separately and, and I think you know, coming up with ideas. And I loved letting go like, of the script on set. Like, I don't know if that's common, but I was just like, yeah, change it. Like Janine was it's like, not. I don't think I would say, <laughs> she's like, I don't think I would say that. I'm like, what would you say? And then she didn't. I was like, that's great, that's great. Cause it's like, I don't know, we didn't have the time to like, have these long discussions, and I trusted everyone, and I had watched all of them do other things, so I just felt so taken care of, and I watched them in their own methods. They say they don't have anything, but I'm watching them privately from the corner, like creeping on them, and seeing them looking at their scripts and focus and breathing, and it, it taught me how to like focus and breathe and really like just sit into it because I thought that I was destroying my life while we were making it. I was like, what am I doing? Like my credit cards, all the money I saved, like I've every person I asked a favor for, this is the end of my life. <laughs> Can I say something about him though? Yeah. Um, what I found about Mark that was so amazing is that first I thought, oh, this is a really inventive, talented, creative person who's come up with a really unusual film that's really risky, because you've got you know, a gay boy babysitting a kid who's drawing pictures of dicks and has fantasies of a SM leather man. And you know, there's a lot of America that would totally freak out just hearing about this. And it's a charming film. It's a heartwarming film somehow. And, and so it's a very risky, sort of unusual creative piece. So I'm looking at this guy and I'm thinking, wow, he's really, he's young, he's creative. He's got great ideas. He's pulled this film together. He's directing it. And then I find out he's been working on this for seven years and, and really pulling it. And then we ran into a lot of obstacles he's not, he's not gonna tell you about. and very tough obstacles, which required raising a lot more money. And, and that was also to get the, film, the, the music in the film, which is really wonderful, and to get that going and all this. This guy is so persistent. And, and what I found, you know, from college moving on, is I've known really, really, really talented people who didn't have the talent to have their talent, didn't have the talent to manage the talent, didn't have the, the will to leave their hometown and go to New York or in LA, or once they were here, 
to be able to withstand the rejection and the, you know, having a job, just couldn't, or couldn't deal with their own substance abuse issues or their own craziness. And, and this kid, I was so impressed by that he is so stubborn. It's really a lot, for me, the survival in this business also has a lot to do with just being so stubborn that you're not gonna give up because you're just too stubborn to, you know? And this person, I'm thinking, has a long career ahead of him because he has that. You know, he has that both. I'm sorry. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's nice to be here. It's really, I mean, my parents were at the last interview I did today and it was very emotional. And uh, yeah, this was not, I didn't think this was gonna actually happen. And when I started, it was super ambitious and a lot of people told me no. And I think that's why the work came out the way it did because we were just so hopeful and positive and we believed in it. And then time went on and uh, indie film was really hard and it's actually becoming way more Hollywood. And you know, Edward Norton had his first film and I read something the other day about the struggle of making his first film and I'm just thinking, you're Edward Norton. <laughs> like, of course, so, so there was just so much going on. I mean, I'm gonna say like that the Me Too movement has not hit the LGBTQ community in the industry, specifically older white gay men who are in charge, and everything is run, everything is run by them, and there, there are movies that should be starring gay actors, but we have these older gay men that are obsessed with casting straight boys, and straight men and yes, Mark. It's 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 not fair and it's it's hurtful and I went through a lot after we made the film, and and I'm 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 okay. Like I survived and uh, yeah, I'm glad that I pushed through. I mean, I'm gonna go take stickers with the movie on it that say like opening Cinema Village November first. I'm gonna go to like ten coffee shops next week and put them on coffee cups the night before we open so that people the next day will have them on their coffee cups. Like, I'm not giving up. Like, I want this movie to get seen. And there are people who are just like, you know, you're done, you made the movie. And it's like, no, like, I wanna be proud and say I did everything I could to make it happen. That's amazing, and it is a huge, <laughs> yes. Too. It's absolutely a misconception that the only part of making a film is when you're making it, and there's so much that comes after that you have to navigate. Um, I also thought it was really interesting, the Kickstarter campaign that you drew in so much support. You raised $90,000, which is almost unheard of a lot of times in independent cinema for a first feature. So congratulations. And I'm just interested in what you feel you did that really helps to drive a successful campaign and how you use that as a way of starting to engage an audience with the film before it was actually even shot. That is insanity that it happened. I mean, it's smoke and mirrors. And I made the, the Cubby Kickstarter like a little bit after Zach Braff did the one for his big feature film. It was like after a couple big celebrities did movie Kickstarters. And in my silly mind, I was like, I'm gonna do a movie Kickstarter and I'm gonna do it for 90,000, you know, which is less than a million or something that Zach Braff did. So I thought I could do it. I shot a little bit of footage like in Park Slope of me and a kid I babysat. And then I had um, the leather daddy, uh, the actor, I'd cast him already and I, I got him to speak on camera. We went to like a couple cities, we threw some parties, um, we invited people. I mean, I don't know, you know what, like there were certain people who came in with big amounts of money and that's how the Kickstarter got there. Uh, Douglas Crimp, who recently passed away, he gave us a lot of money and he's an art curator at, uh, or was at MoMA and PS1. and. There are patrons of the arts, and the people who did fund Cubby are the people who don't actually have a lot of money. They're the people who are passionate, but they want to put their money into something that they believe in. And then, of course, the people that do have the money are like, you know, they string you along for two years and then give you $500. Um, but yeah, the Kickstarter thing is great. I don't like Kickstarter anymore. It's very curated, and it's very, um, they're really, they're kind of in bed with all of the, the industry, like what's cool and what's what's hip now, and Kickstarter used to be a way to cut cut through the the people in power and say, "Look, I'm making something." So I think we got lucky. We got some press, and uh, and people were upset about the fact that it was about a, a, a gay boy and a child and a leather daddy. There was like uh, an article in HuffPo that helped. So it's it's. I don't think it can happen anymore. I would not tell anyone to do crowdfunding for their movie. Yeah. 
And then I wanted to quickly ask you, Peter, about your teaching um, at Princeton, since you teach theater and acting there. Um, and kind of what, what for you as a teacher is most important to impart wisdom-wise to the actors and, and to your students in classes? Whoa. Um, oh, that's like a, that's a biggie. Um, I, 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 the first thing I always say is like, make sure you have a survival job. Um, because it's hard to audition, and um, knowing that like you need that job to pay your bills, I don't think your art, you know, your best art, comes out of that state of panic. Um, and that I'm constantly just reminding them to um, just figure out uh, what they're about and to create a community. Just find the people who understand their work and get them and what they do, and then you and basically define this creative family. And those are the people who you build your career with. And then I just wanted to kind of finish by asking you, Ben and Mark, kind of coming off the back of making your first feature film, what are you proudest of achieving throughout the whole process? <laughs> That's hard. I mean, the fact that it's, we actually always talked about in pre-production and production, if we can just get it on a big screen, in front of some people. We, we don't want it to go, you know, straight to Amazon for rent without ever, without be, we just want to be in a movie theater. And I mean, we grew up loving movies. And I think actually, I think a, lot, a reason that I wanted to be an actor um, was because when you're younger, you fall in love with movies and the actors are what you see. When, that's how you understand what a movie is, you're looking at actors. And as I went along, I kind of learned other things that I loved about it. But um, that experience of sitting in a movie theater, watching great actors do their thing, um, I just I wanted to make that for other people, and we did. Yeah. For me, I mean, at Syracuse, where I went to, um, or I got a degree in acting, I did not fit in. I couldn't get you know sidekick roles. I couldn't get leading man roles. Like I was just this. It was really hard. They were really cruel, and it wasn't a learning experience. It was just like, we're not going to cast half your class because we're going to use the same people over and over again. And throughout Cubby, I know, I hope the school is changing, but that was like 10 years ago. Um, but throughout Cubby, you know, when I finally did see myself on camera and then edited a long time by myself, and then Ben edited, and then we brought a couple people in, and it's a long process, but I, I finally like wept and decided that I loved myself. Hmm. And I didn't love myself before that, and I think it's because growing up, growing up and coming out gay in Indiana, like I had all this trauma, and you move to New York, and you kind of just pretend like it's not there. And and babysitting was, you know, a release for me. I mean, I really loved the time I had with kids because uh, they don't judge, they don't see the problems in the world. So when I saw myself, and I finally decided I I love myself, I love the way I look, and I love who I am and I love acting, that was the moment that I was like, it's all worth it, and uh, and I was just praying that we would get in theaters. And we're gonna play at the Lemley Glendale, and at the Cinema Village, and maybe Chicago, and that's, that's it. Please, please, please tell your friends about the film, independent cinema, every single voice, every single post on social media, friend that you tell makes a difference, and thank you so much. You all have so much to be proud of with this film. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, thanks everybody. Thank you.